like this actually might change the way I live my life. <laughs> you know the way every now and again, I'm, maybe you've had this experience where you kind of realize, oh, actually, I need to change that. And sometimes it's, you know, oh, there's some like moral issue I might need to correct. Whether it was you didn't know it was a moral issue and you're like, oh, wow, okay, yeah, I'm gonna change that. Or sometimes it's just an area that I could grow in, like a virtue you didn't even realize was there. It's like discovering new muscle groups or something, you know, as you work out like, Ugh! <laughs> and then you have to, you know, start again. Anyway, so I had that experience today. I was looking at Matthew 25. So there's lots of different stories in Matthew 25, but the super famous one is where Jesus describes, it's this parable of um, really himself sitting on a throne at the end of the world and all of the people of the nations, everybody is in front of him. He separates sheep from goats, meaning the virtuous and the unvirtuous is kind of the word that's used in Matthew's gospel. And the thing that is the dividing point is, it's basically love. He lists, Jesus lists these acts of charity, these acts of love, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick and those imprisoned, that kind of thing. Uh, he lists them and it's a fascinating thing. And he, in lots of other places, he confirms that it doesn't matter how much faith you have. It doesn't matter how many miracles you work in Jesus' name. Jesus says of these people, I didn't even know you. With just faith, but without it actually being worked out in love, without love manifesting, I think what we have to realize is these two things are actually part of the same reality. We have to keep exercising faith to stay anchored in the kingdom. But then this, this, this thing within us, this life, this kingdom within us grows and it flourishes and bears fruit in love that we get transformed into what? Into God, because this is a description of God who is so kind to us. This is him. And what's beautiful about these, uh, these examples of works of charity, as I was kind of reading them, this is the stuff I'm like, oh, they don't come on the top of my priority list. Like today, I could go and visit some people. I run a little um, after schools program for the six to 11 year olds. I could get together with one of the volunteers and after school is over, I could go and visit the families, go visit the kids. And it's something I haven't done yet. I've been here for what, six months or something and I haven't done that. And, you know, we drop some of them home, at, uh, you know, after the program and be like, hi and say hi to the parents, whatever. But that would be a really beautiful thing. But it's not strictly speaking necessary. There's some people I know who are really sick right now and I could go and visit them not to necessarily do anything. Like I could pray with them. They're not necessarily, you know, going to experience a healing or anything. They've probably got loads of people visiting them. This is my thinking. So, I mean, I could visit them, but it's not strictly speaking necessary. There'd still be them if I don't go. And even if I do go, they might go, oh, that was nice as I leave. I was not nice, Father came to visit me. That was nice. And that's it. So in my mind, it's like, well, it's not really essential. I mean, I've got loads and loads of things to do that are really essential and important. And these other things are, eh. I don't know if you can relate to that. Visiting people in prison. Is that a thing you've ever done? No, lives aren't going to be changed. Well, maybe, yeah, maybe not. But And here's, here's the beautiful thing. Jesus says that this stuff, which in my mind, I'm thinking, well, it's not essential. He, he reveals to us, actually it is. Actually, it is. There is something about doing the thing that you don't have to do that is a loving thing that makes it all the more a pure act of love. I'm reminded of um, this homeless guy. Well, he wasn't homeless. He was staying at our shelter. And so far as our shelter in the Bronx was his home, he wasn't homeless, but essentially he was homeless. The brothers, we would take turns, um, like volunteering different nights. So I'd be on maybe two nights a month because loads of the brothers in New York would be taking part in this. You'd have two brothers on a night. You know, you'd prepare the food, you'd talk to the guys, welcome them in, get them, you know, clothes if they needed clothes, put on a wash, whatever it was needed. And at a certain point, it was uh, uh, optional. We would have night prayer and we had a little chapel there and you'd just go around to the guys and say, hey, I'm going to pray night prayer if anyone wants to join me. Now, at a certain point, there was one of the guys there. He would frequently come in with me, lead some prayers. We actually would do Compline, like the official church night prayer. And then at the end, we'd just sort of see where it went. You know, we'd ad lib, free flowing prayer a little bit. I was so struck by what this guy would say. He'd just look at the cross and he would often be moved to tears as he repeated the phrase, you didn't have to do it. 
you didn't have to do it. And that's all he would say. You know, we'd finish up the prayer, he'd go to bed, I'd go to bed. You didn't have to do it. So if we think of that about our Lord, I mean, that's the truth of our salvation. He was in no way obliged to save us. God doesn't need us. We're not essential to the kingdom. He doesn't need us to, you know, proclaim the gospel for him in order to save the world. He doesn't need us to do good things. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need us at all. He doesn't need your work. He doesn't need your talents. He doesn't need your time. He doesn't need anything. He's completely sufficient in himself. Totally happy. He doesn't need anybody or anything. He has it all in himself. But he wants you. Doesn't need you at all. But he really wants you. You're a bit like a luxury item to him. You're like the most up-to-date mobile phone, cell phone that you can get. Like creme de la creme, fresh, off the shelf, ridiculously expensive. Doesn't need you. Could just get a brick phone, could do all the essentials, but he he doesn't want the brick phone. He wants wants the, the most expensive one. Why? Luxury item, because he wants it. Do you ever have that experience? Oh, I'd love to have the newest phone. I'd love to have a brand new car. I'd love to have the new thing. Mm. There's something desirable about it, isn't there? There is something desirable about you to God. You are a luxury item to him. He doesn't need you, but doesn't that make it all the more special? He just wants you. Not because you're useful, just because you are delightful to him. You're wanted by him. That is something of God's heart. And you could just take that one and meditate on that one, right? Like, ooh. I'm like his iPhone. If you don't like iPhones, that may not work for you. Go for a Galaxy. So that's the heart of God, where he didn't have to do it. He doesn't have to love you, but he does. And that is the essential aspect of his nature. And that's what he wants to see in you. And if he doesn't see it, he doesn't know who you are because you're not like him. You're not one of his children because you're not producing the fruit of the kingdom. We need to produce the fruit of the kingdom. And I'm saying this to myself because I'm not always producing the fruit of the kingdom because I'm not entering into this. Well, I don't have to, but I'm going to. I don't have to go out of my way and visit the sick. In fact, I've got so many other things to do. You're probably the same. It's like, how on earth could I do that, Father? Are you joking me? I know, but we need to turn our world upside down, folks. We need to change our way of thinking. We need to change our way of thinking because we do not think like he thinks, and that is dangerous. We need to start thinking like he thinks. And he's saying it so clearly to us in the scriptures. Unless you change, you become like little children. You won't enter the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, we need to start loving. Not just our friends, not just those who are good to us. Jesus says, what reward is there? You're good to those who are good to you. Please. So unimpressive. Love those you cannot love. Love those you do not have to love. Mm. Let's love those we do not have to love. Let's visit random sick people. I was so convicted by this this morning. I'm like, I have to carve out some time. I have to carve out some time today to visit somebody. I have to do it, folks. And so do you. We have to do this. If we keep putting it off, do you know what? One day we're going to have our particular judgment. One day we're not going to have another opportunity to do something we didn't have to do. But we just did it because that's what God would do. And that's what God in you wants. So let's... Gosh, let's start working on this stuff, folks. Yeah. God bless you.